Hi, and welcome back to the Sounds Like Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Henney, and I'm here today with Matthew Karchner, who's a pastor and author of the Straight Book series. And he re- recently published his third book entitled The Church We Shoot Our Wounded. His is a story of learning to reject pop culture and to stand on the authority of God's word. Welcome, Matt. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm very excited to dig into your story. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, I grew up in a Christian home, central Pennsylvania in 1978. I was born, so today I'm 46 and serving over in Cambodia as a missionary pastor. Um, Came through a lot, like you said, grew up in a Christian home and strong Christian values and studied the word and was in a Christian school next to the church and youth group and very, very well churched. But uh, felt that attraction to the boys and not the girls starting at puberty. And that became my deep, dark secret for a while. Then later on, I came out kind of guns blazing. And um, if you don't accept me, then to heck with you kind of thing. And and so uh, became loud and proud and living in the gay life pretty, pretty extreme uh, out in the bars and getting into a lot of trouble. And then about five or six years into the gay life, uh, it became glaringly apparent that that wasn't uh, a place that I was going to find true love and peace. There was no knight in shining armor. It was just, um, you know, behind the facade of the the gay guy being the funniest guy in the room and and having a beautiful girlfriend, a beautiful woman that he's always with and that sort of thing. The, those are the kinds of things I was I was involved in. I had a seemingly glamorous life on the outside, going out to the bars and cutting through the line and being young and attractive and that sort of thing. But but behind the scenes there was a lot of a lot of uh depression, destruct self-destructive behavior. And Satan was really is really the author of confusion. He comes to steal, kill and destroy and that became apparent several years in when my friends are committing suicide and overdosing. I was severely addicted to a number of substances and and um, just going down the path of destruction, I knew that I would be another quiet funeral if I continued down that path. And so the Lord reminded me of end times prophecy that he's coming back in judgment, that I wasn't ready. And so repented and gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ for real. And that was 14 years ago. Praise the Lord for new life. He did just just did a 180 uh, life revolution, helped me to stop drinking alcohol and drugs and cigarettes and sex with men and anything else i mean just a laundry list of things that i was up to he really uh just gave me the power to to do a 180 and and change my life and then called me to the mission field where i can be a witness to others um through online forums now like like this be a hopefully an inspiration to others back home but also over here in cambodia where where um homosexuality is gaining more of a footing now these days and thailand is the the neighboring country next door that kind of blazes the trail for transgender culture and and surgeries for men to to try to look like a woman and women to to try to look like a man and to decapitate their bodies to to take steps toward that that's happening over in thailand in mass people fly in from all over the world to get discounted surgeries you know compared to the west the cost of operations and that sort of thing much much lower and so um thailand's blazing the trail cambodia looks up to thailand as kind of an older cousin or uncle type of a thing similar culture similar value system uh, same religion and so cambodia is slowly but surely following thailand's lead on that and, and homosexuality the the approval and the normalization of homosexuality is becoming more and more apparent here in Cambodia. So uh, witnessing to the LGBT, not always so easy, a lot of pushback, especially in Buddhist culture, you have you have a couple mountains to climb. Number one, I'm Cambodian or I am Thai, I'm Cambodian, therefore I am Buddhist. Like that's, that's it's such a strong, um, a strong sense of identity related to nationalism and pride, of, pride for country and that sort of thing. And then uh, 
the next thing is homosexuality. I feel attracted to men or I feel I'm a woman attracted to women, therefore I am gay. And that's that's the same thing that we deal with in, in the US where people feel like if I have these feelings, therefore that's who I am. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every, everyone struggles with temptation towards some kind of sin. And the Lord loves us too much to leave us there, right? He calls us to repent, put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive everlasting life, new life in him, abundant life in him. And so that's the mission now to, to call people to repentance and new life in him, whether that's out of a gay lifestyle or out of general sin that uh, gossip and lying and cheating and getting drunk and, and all the things that, that the average Joe in the street struggles with. Absolutely. Very powerful. So then I know this is a real hot button in our culture right now. Um, and, you know, as a mom with tweens and teens is something that, you know, we I have to dig into with my girls. And, you know, how do we, uh, first of all, stand firm in truth, but stand firm also in grace and in kindness and love while not compromising the truth that we hold, which is founded in the Bible. Um, so I know that your book kind of talks about, you know, we shoot our wounded and, and I love how you, t you, we really touched on something and I kind of want to kind of back up here. You talked about how you were really struggling with addiction and depression. And I read a great booklet, um, by one of the leaders in our church network, uh, Lester Zimmerman, it's called Broken Identity. And it was talking about how it's, it, this, this lifestyle is more rooted in brokenness and they're building an identity on brokenness instead of building an identity on wholeness, which is only found in Christ. Um, Amen. And that statement in the book is called broken identity. It's really great. It's a quick read, but it's full of information. Just if anybody's listening here and they look for it online. Um, and I walked through that with my oldest. I plan on walking through it with each of my girls because it was so powerful, so good. And, and, and you talked, you kind of talked about that later in your testimony. We talked about identity and, and I think that even, you know, I operate in the prophetic and prophetically, that's a huge thing God is bringing into the church is this identity as a being a child of God and being royalty in the Lord. And it's interesting to me that the enemy is bringing such a counterfeit move. It's the same, it, it's taking what God is doing and twisting it and it's bringing bondage it's bringing brokenness it's not bringing freedom uh in in healing and wholeness in the way that god wants to bring so i mean those things that you th those things just kind of jumped out to me in your testimony and in your story so if somebody is listening and they're struggling and they're maybe they're they are a christian and they're struggling what is something that you would encourage them with like maybe a strategy or 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 something that gave you hope or was a a pivotal moment uh to to start to take step into that freedom in Christ. Yeah, not to backtrack on what I what I already said, but I think the golden nugget here and what's missing I think in a lot of a lot of churches nowadays sadly to try to hold the people, to try to keep the people coming every Sunday. We tend to preach the bright and sunny side of things, and we we kind of reject the doctrine of depravity of man, if you will, the fact that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So sometimes while we're preaching that uh, good message, you're, you're a child of God, you're royalty and everything. With that come like the takeaway sometimes if we don't preach the full counsel that you're a sinner a fallen a fallen creation of god called to repentance and new life in him and the day that you repent and put your faith and trust in the lord jesus christ is not the day that you rise to a level of sinless perfection that all of your thoughts become perfectly pure and you're you're hovering above the surface of the earth like an angel that does not happen in this life at all no, and i think that, the older i get the more i'm convinced it's a lifelong journey but i think that's the that's the problem 
because we're trying to hang on to the people in the church and we feel like we have to enter- entertain to some degree, even if we're saying we're not doing that, we're, oh, it's kind of like, just tell them God loves them and, and something positive and then let them go home because they'll come back next Sunday. And so then then I think we skipped o- skip over. Um, it, it tends to feel like a, a private club mentality, kind of like, we're all a good person. We're all Christ-like in this building, but everybody else outside is not a good person. And it's like, uh, say, what about the thoughts that come through your head from Monday through Saturday and even on Sunday to gossip, to slander people, to, uh, to lie and uh, compromise your faith in the workplace in order to get ahead, you know, to not, not truly stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, to refuse to share the gospel message because you're scared you'll lose your job. All those things are sin, right? Sins of omission. Um, and so I think that's the big thing for all have sinned and fall short, that we realize that we are fallen creations that we're called to repentance and new life. And that even when we do repent, put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not a finished work. We're a work in progress. And the thoughts that enter our head, even as new creations in Christ, can be thoughts toward homosexuality, toward self-destructive behavior. Um, it, It really is a spiritual war. And, and I think sometimes people also don't want to talk about that. It's like, while we're saying all, all sins are equally forgivable, right? That's, that's one very, very solid Bible truth. If I repent, put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ out of homosexuality, the Lord washes away my sin 100%. If you repent out of lying, cheating, stealing, gossiping, the Lord washes away your sin 100%, right? If it's true repentance. And um, so while we're saying that, um, the other truth is that that doesn't seem to to be aligned with that is that um, Satan works greatly and mightily through homosexuality. It's a demonic struggle. I, I truly believe that that Satan comes in to flip the roles that God designed for man and woman to flip them and make man want to be like a woman, woman want to be like man. It's ungratefulness at the core for what the Lord's given us, the gift that he's given us of manhood or womanhood. It's saying, I, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't like that. I want something different. That's not what I had in mind. You know what I mean? I, I reject that gift. I take that gift back. I don't like it. And so, so we reject it and, and go to extremes to to take a gift that wasn't meant for us and it doesn't work so satan comes in and cunningly deceives sadly in in my past life i was uncomfortable to some degree miserable so depressed at certain points until i took a step toward my sin does that make sense like i was under severe demonic oppression to a point that Satan used that to to control me because I allowed it because I took steps toward that. But he used that to control me. So when I would feel severely depressed, I would feel a sense of relief if I went out and did something destructive to myself or to somebody else. For example, if I went out and drank excessively, I would feel a sense of temporary relief, temporary euphoria. And that's how Satan used me. Used uh, that's what Satan used to drive me forward to to steal, kill, and destroy on his behalf. So it's very, very demonic. And and when we say one thing, I think it waters down another thing. It's like they're they're equally true. For all have sinned and fall short, we must repent, put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even when we do, we're not a finished work. We're a work in progress. The thoughts and thoughts and intentions of our hearts can still be evil. We still have the old man inside and we have the Holy Spirit inside and we have to choose every day to follow the Holy Spirit, to read, read God's word, get into the word, to, to charge our battery, if you will, get into the word, seek the Lord every day and to follow him every day. And, um, and then it's, it's, a, it's a demonic thing. It's not just a human struggle. The enemy's there coming in and, and using his influences in the world to come in to try to lure us back into to our old lives and old thought processes. So it's an ongoing war till the day that the Lord takes us home. Absolutely. And I think, you, and it's definitely 100%, you hit the nail on the head. It's about a balance. It's about knowing who I am in God, 
and that authority that goes with that, the love and the kindness that goes with that, but also that it's like a fear of the Lord where it's like when you yeah. realize how pure and how holy God is, even like me on a best day, like the Bible calls it filthy rags. It's like, well, it, it's nothing. It, it, is, it, pay, it doesn't even pale. There's nothing. It's ashes compared to his glory and his holiness. And so absolutely, there's a balance there of taking the full, the full view of seeing that even though my best day is but ash compared to the glory of God, he still loves me and he still wants to be with us. You know, not just me, all of us. He wants to be with all of us in a relationship and connected and, and gives us the riches of his glory. Don't deserve it by any means. But, um, and it's, it's just the beauty of the cross, right? Um, it, it really what it comes down to that, that place where love and judgment met. Uh, you, you touched there on one thing too, the, the entitlement, I think is, is what I, what I meant to say too. in, in my last response, the, when we talk about we're royalty and royal priesthood and that sort of thing it, it's biblical yes it's biblical but it, it the takeaway in modern times 2024 if we if we preach that to our kids day in and day out you are a royalty you're a royalty in christ you're a queen honey you're a queen you're a king you're a king that the takeaway in modern times in u.s culture today is i'm entitled to something right <laughs> so it actually can be destructive if, if that's all that, that you hear it makes the person feel like I'm being elevated to a place where I deserve a bunch of stuff for doing nothing. And really we, we deserve nothing. Our righteousness is, is like filthy rags. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We deserve hell. So we should be of the opposite mindset. We should be of the mindset that we want to please the Lord while we're here on earth. We want to take a stand. We want to share the gospel. Even if we lose our jobs, even if people pick on us at school, we want to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, call people to repentance. Because people are we're surrounded by people every single day that are bound for hell. And if we truly love them like we pretend like we love them when we go to a church service and talk about the love of God, then we will share the gospel with them. Because that's the only way they're ever going to get to heaven. Repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. We're not going to get to heaven by being a good person. Absolutely. I love that you said that. If we truly love them the way that we say that we love them, the way we are told to love them, we're going to, we should be living our lives differently, right? I love that. We should be, going we should be sharing the gospel, yeah. Not just trying to be a good person, hoping that somebody sees that I'm a good person because my grandma was a good person. She She didn't know the Lord until right before she died. You know what I mean? So, just me me being a good person and doing good things doesn't lead anybody to heaven necessarily. You know what I mean? Act, we can say actions speak louder than words, yeah, but I need to open my mouth and share the gospel message. For all have sinned and fall short. We must repent, put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only he can save because he died on the cross for our sins and rose again. He paid the price for our sins 100% with his blood. There's no other way to heaven but by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming back one day to judge. We must be ready. Simple gospel message needs to be preached. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're right. Again, it's that pairing. It's the word and the deed. Word sure. and deed going together. So tell us about your book, Church We Shoot Our Wounded. And I'm very curious to hear about that because, you know, I think that sometimes, and we talked about that entitlement, we talked about all those things that can kind of go into some behaviors, uh, very human <laughs> behaviors yeah. that can hurt, right? Um, and even just as somebody who also grew up in the church, went to Christian school, you know, worked in a Christian restaurant, went to a Christian coffee house, I was a Christian bubble girl growing up, you know, um, just how how do we as a church, you know, if we're reaching people, we should be reaching uh, the LGBT community, right? We should be reaching them with the love of Christ. Um, and how do we, how do we respond when they come into our churches? How do we respond when they come to our youth groups, uh, yeah. around our kids, and teaching our kids and ourselves 
to share that love and kindness of Christ first, because it's the kindness that leads us to repentance. And how do we not hurt, hurt the wounded and instead bring healing and bring them in to the fold of the Lord? Yeah. In general, humility, I believe, is the biggest key here. Humility to to acknowledge, like I said, if, if we, the church, are positioned in such a way that, that we know that we are fallen creations, and yes, we've given our lives to Christ, but we're still a work in progress. And if we, we reflect on ourselves, examine ourselves, and then we see, oh, okay, so yesterday some thoughts came into my head that weren't exactly Christ-like, right? I had a argument with somebody and, and wanted to say something I shouldn't have said or or something maybe even worse. And so I know that I'm not, I haven't arrived at sinless perfection. If we're at that state and then that person walks in the door of the church, then I think we're in a good place. But if we feel like I'm a good person and they're not good people, that's not biblically accurate. So I think that's that's where we run into problems when, when we're saying, kind of like tackle that guy at the waist. He's not living right. It, it's like, well, neither were you when you came in the door. <laughs> Right. right. And, and and still maybe not to some degree. Right. So so I think that's where the humi humility needs to be. I think some people are, are more. Group oriented. And to, these days, I in my situation, I was I'm very much only child. My. My upbringing was very much only child. I, I spent a lot of time with my dad and. and um, hiking and hunting with him and doing outdoor stuff. But um, my mentality is very much uh, army of one kind of thing. And I think the, that's how the Lord's created me. That's how the Lord uses me. I have to stand alone, especially as a missionary over here. Most people are 96% of the country's Buddhist. Um, you have small, small pockets of Christians. And so I think that's part of how the Lord designed me. But um, so for me, when I came into the church and there, there was a really, I think a lot of churches have a really strong church culture of we all need to be doing exactly the same thing and signing up for the same programs and reading the same books. And if if you guys don't do what I'm what I think needs to be done, whether it's biblical or not, then you're not as good as I am. Or maybe you're not really following Christ the way you should, because that's not how I do it or something like that. That was a lot of what I dealt with when I came into the church. It was like my dad, my who has my been my spiritual mentor, said, "Get into the Word every day. Read it. Read a paragraph. Read a read a page. Seek the Lord every day. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't follow people." Right? Then I came into the church, and, and so my dad's kind of like, "It's that simple." Then the Lord will lead you. Your relationship has to be with Him. That'll make or break you. And then I come into the church. It's like, have you read the New York Times Christian bestseller, such and such? If you haven't, please sign up for our next supposedly Bible study, but they're reading a New York Times bestseller. That's not a Bible study. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then uh, we don't think you're accountable enough because you came out of a questionable lifestyle. We, we want to hold you to account with a, a men's group so that they can check in with you every every Wednesday at 8 a.m. and and interrogate you to make sure that you're doing what we think you should be doing. That you're, you're following Christ like Deacon John is following Christ. It's like, that's not biblical Christianity to me. That's, that's modern American wishy-washy follow whatever pastor selling the most books this year. You know what I mean? That, and, and there'll be all, all kinds of catchphrases that are being used and stuff that you're supposed to jump on the bandwagon with them. So that really, really um, kind of like threw a wet blanket on my relationship with Christ. And I was kind of co politely coerced into stuff like that. And I think there's a lot of fear around it. I think in my situation, it's like, so he came in out of homosexuality now he's up front in the church sharing his testimony. Then he signed up. He wants to work with kids. He wants to work with youth. Huh. You know what I mean? It 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 sounds like your 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 sense of risk management starts to kick in. Like, uh, not sure I want him near my kids. You know what I mean? He and it's like, well, 
my past had nothing to do with children. On my on my darkest day following Satan, I was in no way involved sexually with a child or anyone underage. But but they're they're pairing those two together. Homosexuality is quote unquote deep sin. Therefore, probably he would be susceptible to this or that. So a lot of a lot of kind of false accusations or or thinking with fear came into play with me. And so I would say don't jump on top of them don't tackle them at the waist don't see them as as anything different try to treat them roughly the same as you allow them to grow in christ to do christian basics and get in, encourage them to get into the word every day seek the lord every day and let it go at that you know what i mean mm-hmm. you treat somebody like an alien then they it, it tends to not work out real well it's like why am i so much worse than you guys why do you you guys seem to think you you have it all nailed down, you know? So the Lord had a very specific plan for my life and and they didn't know that. I think they didn't want to believe that. They felt like you're, you're um, not following Christ like we think you should be. You're not aligned with some of our values, which are kind of reminded me of corporate values because I worked in a bank. So the, the values of the church nowadays, like a modern style church kind of, more, were more remin- reminiscent with corporate America than they were God's word, you know, kind of loosely attached to God's word, but not really. So you find yourself kind of off over here trying to please the people in the church, trying to please the leadership at the expense of your relationship with Christ. So um, I, the church we shoot our wounded, the, the book is really about coming in and, and the, the older brother in the prodigal son story rejecting me saying, I, I don't know why you're throwing a party for him. I've been following the Lord faithfully all these years. I never fell away. How dare you throw a party for him? You know, and that's, that's a lot of what, I, what I've run into in the church. And a lot of it comes back to, I believe, spiritual pride. I, I, think, I think a certain sect of people within the church, professing believers nowadays, believe that homosexuality is the unpardonable sin. Um, One pastor told me, I've never heard of anyone that the Lord called to reach the LGBT. Almost like they're not worth it. Like they're they're trash to be discarded or something. Just the the mentality of of so many people, when you you start to share a story like mine, you you see the looks on people's faces. And and sadly, I, I think it usually takes a someone struggling with homosexuality within their immediate family to really break through to where they have any any sense of compassion for for a story like mine another thing that that comes up is the lord has led i'm required to share the gospel message like the for all have sinned and fall short the call to repentance and faith in christ some churches don't preach that anymore And also tucked within my testimony that the Lord was leading me to get up and stand in front of the church and share and out in the streets and sharing is a warning against alcohol. And many churches nowadays have have said, we live under grace. There's no problem with casual drinking. So um, I I kind of found found myself to be a bit of a Trojan horse, (laughs) like the Lord. The Lord has this stuff that the church has discarded that he wants to be preached, but everybody refuses to preach it. And it's tucked within my testimony. And I'm put up in front of the church to share this stuff that nobody wants to hear anymore. So they're squirming in the in the pews and kind of like, get him out of here, whatever it takes, get him down. So the, the one church, my first church, allowed me to share my testimony until I went too far with it, till I got too real with it, you might say, talking about um struggles with alcohol and demonic the demonic side of of homosexuality and just warning people not to get started drinking like i did because it was a door that once i opened they couldn't close and things like that it had people very uneasy and so the leadership in the church said we don't have time for your testimony anymore we we're up against a like a a tough <laughs> a tough schedule here for our our sermon you know our sermon time doesn't allow for it so stuff like that started to happen and um so so you say what's how did what's the remedy i think the remedy is back to solid doctrine 
the remedy is back to preaching the full counsel of God, what, what the Bible really says, not what the New York Times Christian bestsellers say, but what the Bible really says, the, that we're morally and spiritually bankrupt, that there's no other way to heaven but by grace through faith, repentance and grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he's coming back in judgment. Nobody's better than anybody else. Homosexuality is not the unpardonable sin. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. 11 says, and such were some of you. So there were people sitting there in the Corinthian church Paul was writing to in, in the church in Corinth, and they had repented, put their faith and trust in Christ out of homosexuality and had been their sins had, washed, had their sins had been washed away. They'd been redeemed. And that was in the first century, right? So if it happened then, it can happen today. So this back to back to solid doctrine, I think, is the remedy for for the whole shooting match. <laughs> All the stuff that I yeah. solid doctrine, humility. I heard humility and um, and kindness. I think is what I'm hearing yep. also in that. Too. Now I was I now I I was humble to a fault. And a lot of times, like I took the preaching in the church, especially the first church I, I was in for years and served in faithfully for years that I just mentioned, that was ACAC in Pittsburgh, Allegheny Center Alliance Church. And um, the Lord really used that fellowship. The, the people there were a blessing to me and everything. So I'm not... Uh, shooting down the whole church it's just i'm just trying to be honest about what happened there but um there were i took the the preaching about humility very very seriously and i came out of what i knew to be deep sin and and i felt that i'm just a sinner saved by grace i knew that 100 percent, and so i really humbled myself i really really did before the leadership and before people to a fault and um I was kind of trampled underfoot for that. And so that happened church after church after church. The Lord called me to, to, to missions and the pastorate. And it still kept happening until very recently. Here I am, 46 years old, over in the mission field, being kind and sweet to everybody to a fault, to such a fault that I was kind of not stepping into my leadership role. You know what I mean? I, I was allowing whoever came around to kind of dominate or or lead me or maybe he has a point i need to be humble and follow him what about that one what about that one it's like now who did the lord call to be a pastor here why are you following everybody that comes through the door so so um i i took it is possible to take humility too far i guess is the point especially when the lord's called you to be a leader not a follower and so the lord's really led through some difficult stuff recently um there's a church nearby my church over here in Cambodia. The leadership is from the Philippines. Pastor Madling Awa, Joel Madling Awa. Um, whether it's competition, there's a what all exactly happened in the background. Uh, it's kind of a bigger story, but I think it boils down to there's a sense of competition among pastors sometimes that the congregation doesn't always see. Like the nearby church, the church down the road is my competitor. I need to, to show up a little more than them or do a bigger program than them in order to have a bigger standing in the community or something like that. There's a lot of spiritual pride in that. Um, that's in the U.S. I've seen that too, but I, I think often that's hidden from congregations. So they just think that um, everyone's okay. So over here, I think that was kind of one of the dynamics. Um, People say things about me because I've been honest about my past, about my forgiven sin that I haven't gone back to in 14 years, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And because I've been honest as part of my ministry, the Lord requires that. I go out and share with the LGBT, I share with youth, I share with everybody about where I've been and what the Lord's done for me and praise Him for it. And because of that, I take some flack. Truth uh, brings some consequences. And so, that local church, that pastor has uh, falsely accused me in the community. He's told people, don't go to his church. He's a bad, bad pastor. That's a bad church. If you go there, don't tithe. So the pastor and his congregation have told people, people have jumped on board with it. 
that they shouldn't come to my church. And so that's what I'm in the middle of right now. And I really had to go over and confront him face to face. And and I'm so non-confrontational. I was the one that was bullied in high school, um, beaten down, my backpack thrown down, laughed and scoffed and mocked at because of the struggle that I was going through at the time. And so I never really came out of that. I never really, I never really came out of that to be able to stand and say, no, this is not going to happen again, no more. And so the Lord's led to that over the past just year, actually. <laughs> Talk about a late bloomer, 46, 45, um, at the beginning of this. And, and the Lord's led to really confront people face to face. So I went around the community and confronted people and said, that's a lie. That's what, what you're saying about me is not true. And I won't allow it. You know what I mean? And so gave it to the Lord after that. But the Lord required that of me. I think I think to a general church person who hasn't stepped into my shoes, I think it looks like he's unforgiving. He, he needs to walk in forgiveness and turn the other cheek. It's like, well, in my very particular situation of being bullied my whole life, the Lord has actually used this to man me up, to to encourage me to step up, to give me an opportunity to step up and say, I'm a man, treat me with respect. I'm a pastor. Don't talk down to me like I'm a dog. I'm not a dog, I'm a pastor. And so um, that's how the Lord's worked it. He, he brings good out of bad and, and praise the Lord for that. But I'm trusting that he He does a work in, in this nearby church, this nearby pastor and, and his cronies so that so that this is all brought to naught because it's really been irritating to say the least. Right, yeah, and I definitely think there's a place for uh, confrontation and humility, like through humility, truth, grace, all those things, because, you know, God, people connect with people, <laughs> you know, and but it doesn't make, you know, other people's sins against us okay by any means, yeah. you know, and I do pray that the Lord will bring some, some truth into that and some uh, wisdom and grace into that situation uh, that, that um, yeah, that, that fellowship of unity can, can really happen in that church in between you guys, for sure. But your right. uh, website is xgaywitness.com. Can you tell us uh, what people will find? Oh, xgaywitness.com, E-X-G-A-Y. I T N E S S dot com. And there's a link on that site that's that's uh, related to podcasts and book related information. There's a link right in the middle at the top that says um, our ministry, I think is what it says. You click on that, it goes to castawayministries.org. Castawayministries.org is about the mission in Cambodia as a monthly monthly prayer update, what's what's been happening in the church and evangelism over here. Awesome. Well, go ahead, check out his books, check out his website, xgaywitness.com. And don't forget to swipe, tap, or click over to deborahenny.com. Follow me on social on the X, Instagram, or Twitter, or sorry, the X is Twitter. It keeps messing me up. Or Facebook at Deborah Henny Author. And let's not forget to tune into our thoughts to make sure they sound like Jesus's so they sound like freedom. <laughs>